Welcome to today's presentation. Before we begin such presentation, we would like to give you some general announcements. And to give you the first of those, por un momento voy a cambiar a español, solo para recordarles que esta presentación está protegida por derechos de autor. No es posible reutilizarla ni reproducirla sin autorización por escrito por parte de Pearson Educación. De igual manera, Pearson Educación es responsable de recabar sus datos personales su uso y correcto manejo de acuerdo a los lineamientos de privacidad de datos que pueden encontrar en nuestro aviso de privacidad que está referenciado en la parte baja de esta diapositiva. That being said, let us go ahead and start with today's presentation. Um, today, we are happy to be here. My name is David Lozano. I am an educational coach for Pearson Education in Mexico. And it'll be my pleasure to share this screen time with my friend and co-worker, Nancy Reeves. Nancy. Hi, my name is Nancy. Um, as David, I'm also an educational co uh, coach for Pearson. And today we are honored to talk to you about a very interesting topic, which is HyFlex. Um, we're going to have a very vivid presentation. So we hope that you enjoy it. Hopefully it will bring to your attention information that we think it's vital, particularly in the dawn of this new normal that we're all facing as teachers. Now, in order for us to talk about the HyFlex model or just HyFlex, uh, we're gonna cover a couple of very basic points in our agenda today. First of all, we will um, share with you a definition of what the HyFlex delivery model is. Then we'll talk about the requirements to implement the HyFlex model, and we will also showcase some examples of how you can implement this model effectively throughout your educational reality. And then we'll have a couple of minutes for a question and answer session in which you will be able to interact with us and we will answer the questions for you. Now for this first part of the workshop about the HyFlex model, I would like to mention though, that in HyFlex or hybrid flexible classes. Students are typically given full control over their decisions to participate in their educational setting, either online or in person in the classroom. This allows them to participate based on convenience, learning progress, social interaction preference, or depending on what part of Latin America you want to implement this model on how your country is dealing with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Some countries in Latin America, we know that you're already going back to in classroom setting for your classes. Some countries in Latin America, we're still working on a distance learning setting. But as we prepare to transition into going back fully into the classroom, both Nancy and I strongly believe that the HyFlex model is a very interesting, available, and different innovative way to prepare to go into that transition by allowing teachers and students to experience education in a somewhat different way. Now, Brian Beatty is an associate professor of instructional technologies in the Department of Equity Leadership Studies and Instructional Technologies at San Francisco State University. And he is one of the first or foremost proponents of the HyFlex delivery model. And he has had experience in implementing this delivery model in a higher education setting. But as you will see through this presentation, the beauty of the HyFlex model is that it can be adapted and implemented at all levels of education, allowing students to better transition from a distance learning setting to an in-classroom, in-person learning setting and allowing teachers to really help their students, not just with that transition, but in the actual learning process that has to happen as we transition. You know, it, it's relatively interesting to us that when we talk about going back into the classroom, some proponents of going back into the classroom forget about the fact that education has still been taking part and has still been happening as we work in a distance learning setting. So the high flex model is not just forgetting about one delivery model and moving into the next delivery model. 
it's finding the best of both yes. while also allowing students a very, well, not just interesting, but a very unique opportunity to have the power to decide how they would like to approach their educational setting. Now, that is something that traditionally in what we refer to as basic education, kindergarten, elementary, junior high school, high school, and in, even in some higher education settings, that is a choice that they normally don't have. And allowing students to, well, choose based on personal preference, perhaps out, do out of medical reasons, due to how they feel about socialization in general, then that is not just a powerful tool, but it's a very empowering option for the student, him or herself. So we really want you to get to know the high flexibility model and the different ways in which we can implement it. Now, talking about the implementation of the model itself, one would perhaps think that it is something that is difficult to prepare for or that you're gonna need a lot of investment either in, you know, in infrastructure or the training of your teachers or helping your students get you know, accustomed to it, but not really. The beauty of the high flex delivery model is that it allows you to work on infrastructure that already exists, whether at school or at home. And you allow students to bridge the gap between both places, the virtual at-home setting and the in-school, in-classroom setting through the high flex delivery model. The model itself, because it allows teachers and institutions and families and students to choose what portions of the curriculum or what classes I'm going to be taking in person and which ones I'm, going, I'm still gonna be taking on a distance learning setting, we strongly believe it is perfectly positioned to allow us to transition in this time of COVID-19 lockdown into a delivery model that acknowledges the existence of the sanitary conditions that brought us into the lockdown, but <laughs> understand that the COVID-19 virus and any other type of you know, medical emergencies that may be out there are not going anywhere. And we need to allow ourselves the opportunity to continue with the educational purpose of our schools and our teachers and fulfilling the educational needs of our students, regardless of what kind of situation awaits as we go out. So the HIFEX model acknowledges the risk, but also really puts their eyes on the reward of allowing students to have this opportunity to not just transition, as I've mentioned several times in my small presentation, but to really react to this new reality, this new normal everybody was talking about in the year 2020. Well, that's here right now. So we need to find different ways to address education in this new normal. Nancy, I don't know if you would like to add anything about it at this point. Uh, no, uh, like David was saying, COVID is something that came and it's not necessarily, and it just what it did is like it pushed, it pushed us to technology and it pushed for us to find a system that will adapt our students and our teachers into creating this uh, facilitating a learning process. Not only you're going to have a hybrid, um, hybrid system, but you have to also develop a flexible one. So you don't penalize the students who are going to be in the setting or in the classroom setting and also the ones that are going to be online. And another aspect is that you're going to be closing those distance gaps. Maybe the student lives far, far away and he cannot probably make it or he cannot move to the place that he was. Maybe he was staying in a dorm. If we're talking about university students or maybe he would stay with a family from another town. So in this case, you're, you're closing that bridge and you're allowing the students to really get that proper education that we have been fighting for and we have been working with our students. So you're going to be able to um, help them out, out with this one and also prep them for the reality. We have been taught in a particular way. 
And I always want to make this joke that I'm like one, I'm half, you know, one foot in and the other one is out. Um, but our kids are literally going into a technology world. Like my kid can turn on the television with my phone and I have no idea how it works, but they have this and they know how to do this. So um, HyFlex is going to allow you to see that and it's going to allow you as a teacher. And like David said, it doesn't wreck, you know, it doesn't really require a lot of things. Of course, it requires technology and the, no, the knowledge of technology, but it requires mostly the motivation of the teacher. So if you're willing to do this, you're going to do it. And then the planning, you're pretty much just have to make some tweaks to your plan activity or your, your activities, but the objectives have to be exactly the same. Okay. All right. Thank you, Nancy. Now, as educators, you've been hearing for the past couple of years that you should find ways to personalize learning, that you should be aware of your students' learning methods or the preferred way in which they like to learn. You have been told to be aware of, you know, pedagogical advancements like Bloom's taxonomy when it was updated for this new reality we're living in. So in a way, you already have the flexible, adaptable background that is required to work with the high flex delivery model. To sum it up, you need to be flexible. You need to expect the unexpected, but you also need to be aware of your learning objectives, your planning, and where you're going from. So this multitasking educator, which we know already exists in you, is what is required for the HyFlex model. How would you sum up the HyFlex model, Nancy, like in a, in a brief introduction kind of situation? Like I mentioned before, it's a hybrid flexible system that it doesn't punish the students and that is going to provide both, um, both like uh, provide education in both different settings, online and on-site. So everybody's going to have access to the information in the, based on their own pace, and you're going to, again, re um, reach the same objectives. All right. Um, maybe we can make it a little bit easier to digest. If not mm -hmm. hearing it from us, but let's just show them, you know, a little bit of a pictograph here. Um, can you walk us through this pictograph, Nancy? Yes, of course. So um, in, what is HyFlex? So there you go. So first you have the portion of the classroom. You have your books, you have your pencil, you have your desk, and it's all nice and pretty in your classroom. But then you have the other section, which is the technology, which is all the digital part of the world. And you're going to combine them both. Whenever you have a synchronized setting, you're going to be live, okay? And then you have an asynchronized setting which is going to be you providing the recording. So right now, for instance, I am with you guys, but this is being recorded. So cons consequently, this is going to be in a synchronized format for you guys, because you're going to see it in a different time. So that is going to happen. So right now with David, we're seeing this information at the same time. So we have our microphone, we have our computer, we have all the resources that we need in order to teach this class that will be part of the traditional setting with the use of technology. We have our bandwidth, we have everything else that we need that, for us to be successful at teaching our class, okay? And then the students are online, which in this case, will be you guys, um, you're going to have the video and you're going to have access to this video in order to understand what is high class. So that is the way and that is the beauty of the system. You don't necessarily have to be here with us. You don't necessarily have to be in a particular time or a particular day, but you can accommodate this video to your schedule. And some of our students have that issue, especially right now in the situation that we're living, or for instance, in any type of situations where we have a phenomenon going on, we can go ahead and use the video and the recording the teacher has done, and then we can see it whenever it's more convenient. Of course, there are deadlines. Remember, we're teachers, we have deadlines, but that is the difference between them, okay? All right, thank you so very much, Nancy. I would only like to add, uh, you probably were picking up on the keywords Nancy was mentioning, uh, choice, flexibility. I had already mentioned before, adaptability. And one of the things that is sometimes assumed in this kind of you know discussions, but we don't wanna assume it, 
we just want to say it up front. This is a change that has to be embraced by all actors in the educational level. It has to be embraced by administrators, coordinators, principals, teachers, parents, and students, because this is truly a way to disrupt the current educational system in the countries of Latin America and try something different. Something different that is a perfect way to respond to the current pandemic. But as Nancy was mentioning, it's not going to stop when the pandemic goes away. Because we're not just trying to showcase the high flex model to you during this pandemic. This is something that can has a wonderful start right now, but it should continue moving on because the benefits of the high flex model can outlast the COVID-19 pandemic. All right. So we've already very, you know, concisely shown you what the high flex model is. Let's talk about those itty bitty tiny detail of requirements that Nancy was talking about. And as we go through the requirements, you are going to start noticing that, hey, I, I, I got those things. I, I know what I've they are. That. I already done it, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Because again, <laughs> this is not something that should be alien to you if you've been involved in education in the past five, 10, 15, 20 years. And right now, in the past 12 months, you know. And in the past 12 months. Really yes, into this. <laughs> All right. So you heard Nancy mention uh, when she was talking about the high flex model that this also works not just online and in classroom settings, but also online asynchronously, online synchronously. So when you're working the online component of the high flex model, it is also quite valid to use an online asynchronous model. So start changing the way you perceive or think how your classes work because the high flex model is like throwing a wrench in the machine and just making something new out of it. All right, so let's show you some of the requirements that we have for the high flex model to be implemented in your educational setting. There really are four aspects to include when teaching in a high flex system. One, managing a multimodal learning environment, which pretty much means some of your classes will be online, some of your classes will be in person, in the same school year, semester, bimester, however day, way, hour. <laughs> exactly, day, hour, however way you divide up your school time, you're gonna have online and in person. And sometimes even on the same week, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you're going to be working in school and Thursdays and uh, Tuesdays, you're going to be working distance learning, mm -hmm. whether you're at home or once the pandemic starts to get in control, maybe your students are going to be on a distance learning setting, but not necessarily at home. They're going to be maybe at school campus, maybe on a local coffee shop, maybe at their grandparents' house, who knows, but they're still gonna be working in your classes. You so just mentioned one, my favorite thing, a coffee shop. Ooh. A coffee shop. Ooh. We are all ready to go back to the coffee shops. <clears throat> so anyways, first requirement, multi-model learning environment and the ability to manage it. Now, remember teachers that are in this session, you are not the sole responsible for the management. You're gonna be working with your administrators, with your supervisors, and with the parents and the students. So when we talk about managing this multi-model learning environment, it's not just one more thing we're gonna put on the teacher's shoulders. It's a burden we all have to carry, which is actually the second requirement, workload. The workload. <clears throat> As we work in the high flex model, you're going to have to change the way you think about classroom assignments, about homework, about research, about project-based learning, because those can still happen in the high flex delivery model. Mm -hmm. But you're gonna have to be aware that for some of your classes, some of your months of the year, weeks of the month or days of the week, your students are not gonna be with you. And I want you to think back at the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown, where educators worldwide were given pretty much about a week and a half or two to 
to transition from having your students in front of you in the class to you have not seen them physically in over a year. You were able to do that transition very, very quickly. So if you take time, you should be able to transition to, you know, in your mind, always having to remember that, oh, wait, on these days and at these hours, I'm not going to have them in front of me. So I'm going to have to redistribute the workload. Yeah, and if I, I'm sorry, oh, if I can add this, um, David, is like, remember how parents get so obsessed about finishing the book and the students have to be like, put my money in the book. In this case, you have to start really filtering the aspect of giving students busy work or busy work. Because some yep. teachers, you know, we see ourselves in the position of just giving them pages after pages after pages um, because we are being asked and demanded to go ahead and complete a book whenever we know that's not an effective way of teaching. So in this case, like David has mentioned, you are going to reconsider the way and the workload that you give to the students because you cannot do it like you were doing it before. And it's, you have to be something that it is more effective and meaningful for the students because that is what education is coming about. It's going to be all about meaningful activities, something that is going to relate them to the real life scenario and prep them eventually for, again, the future. So you're going to be targeting self skills, you're going to be targeting 21st century skills, and you're going to be prepping them for what is, is coming, you know, what is to come. One of the benefits of working for Pearson is that we are given access to white papers, research, uh, we're, we're able to compare and contrast what's happening worldwide. And one of the things that we at Pearson we're seeing coming is a complete disruption of the educational model. And instead of focusing on, you know, academic knowledge, we're going to start focusing on skills mm -hmm. and what you can do with what you are being taught. And since we are living in exponential times in which access to information is readily available to everybody and your students no longer require any kind of adult or direct supervision to access information, then as we start to prepare for a future that is unknown to the majority of us, because we're preparing students to major in careers that do not exist or to major in fields of learning that are just being developed, because we're also preparing them for a workforce that is not, well, available yet. <laughs> so beginning to be flexible with your workload, it's not just about making your classes more manageable to you as a teacher, but that really starts allowing you to personalize learning, to really respond and react to what your students really need and not just following a syllabus or a curriculum blindly. Mm -hmm. Now, this and is one of the reasons why we mentioned this is a transition that has to be done by every actor in the educational play because we all need to be behind it. And if we are talking about managing multimodal learning environments and redistributing the workload for both the teacher and the student, then we're also talking about the third requirement which is a different way to work with student instructor interaction. You're not going to be the 100% responsible for the learning progress of your students. You're gonna share it with your students themselves. You're going to trust the parents to assist. You will trust your administrators to work with you. It's all a matter of interacting differently. And right now, this session is a perfect example of it. We would love to be able to be with you in person. We, well, we've been teachers for a while. So we were told and we were thought that the most meaningful learning experiences came from the in-person setting. Mm -hmm. But what we have experienced as Pearson educational coaches and as educational professionals is that you know what, the in-person setting works, but the virtual distance learning setting also works. And we can be just as effective as if we were in front of you right now, if we know how to do this, which hopefully we do. 
So yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 go again. Sorry, go no, ahead. no, and it's it's true. Like our interaction with our students is is going to completely change. Like David says. The teacher becomes a role model, the teacher becomes the mentor, the teacher becomes the guide. But in this case, and in this type of format, the student has to be empowered, the student has to be <clears throat> responsible for his or her own learning. So this allows that to happen, because like we've said, whenever this is this is our reality, we were taught the way that our teachers, you know, we were taught a specific way, we were taught the way the teachers were taught. And consequently, eventually, maybe that's what we're doing. So we need to change our mindset and start understanding that our students are completely different and they're going to see a different reality than the one that we're experiencing. So we have to prep them to that and we have to start being open-minded to say, okay, well, this is a new system. This is a new structure. This is what's going to happen to them. We don't know what type of jobs they're going to have. I know the yep. you know, educators, we're good, we're safe, woo -hoo. but we don't know what is going to happen to them. So in this dynamic, we're in this, you know, with this program, and, you know, we have to change that. We have to change that report with our students. We have to create spaces, um, but we have to make sure that those spaces are effective and that we really deal and target the problem of the student and we become more of a coach. That's the purpose. We are going to be a coach for our students and let them be because like they say, my, one of my friends says in Spanish, San Google knows it all. So they can find everything in Google. Like they can find, we don't need to be providing them with the knowledge. We are here to provide them with the skills, which are the ones that we have mastered. And one of those skills is exactly what to do with that information. You know, just like Nancy is saying, at this moment, any, any student, any age can just go online and ask Google, you know, those questions that before Google, they were being asked to you, the teacher. Now, as we talk about the HyFlex model, the requirements have been managing the multimodal learning environment, which may be synchronous or asynchronous, balancing the workload, finding a new way to engage in student instructor interaction, and finally, the last requirement, and I'm pretty sure you're not surprised by it, assessing learning progression. I remember not too long ago in situations when we're Teachers were rewarding the effort of their students. And if little Johnny had scored a, I'm not, I'm just going to say maybe a 69. Well, you know, little Johnny, he's really working hard and he's shown up for the classes and he brings his notebooks very nice. I'm going to reward him by giving him an extra point. And now Johnny has 70. And in some of the countries of Latin America, a 70 is a passing score. That never really helped Johnny. And when you were trying to do a reference to how Johnny was progressing, we were always finding this very subjective ways in which Johnny was advancing through his educational career. From K all the way to 12 and beyond, there was always someone who was rewarding effort. There was always someone who really enjoyed having Johnny as a student and when it came down for, you know, passing grade on Johnny, they were always nice with him. And again, I'm not criticizing anybody, but that's the past. As we move forward into the future, as we try to really prepare our students for the workforce of tomorrow, we need to transition into objective ways to measure student progress and to create classroom environments in which data drives our instruction because when you make a decision as to how you teach your class based on data the game changes mm -hmm. let me give you a very simple example before nancy says what i know she wants to say i know i know <laughs> if, if you measure students progress in their english proficiency to give you an example and you are able to know that johnny needs some help in grammar because you have a common error report that showcases all of the grammar mistakes, not just Johnny, but everybody in the class is making. And you make a decision to change your lesson plan to reflect that you need more grammar practice. That is a data-driven educational decision that reacts to your students' need and will create a specific benefit for them. 
there is nothing wrong with your teaching experience. You sometimes can look at a student, you can see him or her interacting in the classroom and you can tell, huh, maybe Jack needs a little bit of help here. And the majority of teachers out there, if you've been a teacher for more than one year, you develop this finely honed sense to know how your students are progressing. I'm not disregarding that. But if you compare your educational experience with data, with objective information about your students' academic progress, and you can use that for your classroom instruction, ladies and gentlemen, you're on the other side and you're preparing your students for the 22nd century and whatever's coming up front. Nancy, you wanted to say something, please go ahead. I know you know me about data. Um, yeah. And the thing about data is that sometimes we as teachers, we, you know, we kind of want to be nice to Johnny. We was like, oh, well, Johnny, he's struggling. He has this. But at the end of the day, like David says, like, we're not helping him. And it's like, let's put it this way. When you guys haven't done your job properly, does your principal, does your boss tell you, I'm going to give you a second chance. They might give you a second chance, but then on the third one, you might get a memo. So I know I was a principal. So, you know, you have, <laughs> I know, you have to figure out that this is real life as well. So by monitoring the progress of the student, by monitoring how you can help them and how you can fix those gaps, you're actually producing a nice learning environment. Data, don't be afraid of it. Like, don't be scared. Like a lot of us, especially in humanities, oh my God, we're terrified of numbers. Like, what is the number? Like, oh my God, what is, you have a weird symbol on your wall. No, numbers can be your friends if you know how to use them. If you know how to see and track the information and the progress of your students, like David said, very, very clear example. If more than 70% of your class doesn't know how to, you know, do a particular cost, adverbial cost, then you kind of need to go back and you know review that. But if 70% of your class does know how to do it, then you're not going to frustrate them because the 30% doesn't know how to do it. You're going to take the 30% out, give them additional help, and then the 70s are the 70% is going to move forward. Okay. You're not going to leave anybody behind, but you're going to target and you're not going to frustrate your entire class. And with those decisions come based on data, then your administrator is happy and parents are more willing to have a discussion with you when they know that you're using data to decide, well, pretty much the future of their student. And you remove this very common cultural situations that we face in Latin America in which parents will come to you and say, yeah, I know that the reason why my son is failing is because you hate him so much. Oh my God. You know that I had a student like that? The mom, <laughs> said, you hate him. And I was, my response was like, I was just like this. I was like, you know what? I don't have time to hate anybody. <laughs> and the kid is like, I'm afraid of you. Like, why are you afraid of me? Is that maybe I have a very strong personality. Maybe, who knows? But yeah. I'm pretty sure every teacher in Latin America and some outside of Latin America have faced that situation in which your professionalism comes into play due to, well, feelings. So using data, <coughs> excuse me, using data allows you to remove feelings out of the equation and focus on the learning, which is what we're going for. So just to sum it up, if you have heard about the high flex models from David and Nancy, and you are thinking it may be an interesting thing to start using in your educational settings, remember that your four requirements are being able to manage a multi-model learning environment, redistributing the workload to reflect this new reality in which we're all living, find a better, much more modern, much more adequate way to interact with your students, and finally, when it comes to assessing learning progression, the word of the day is data, data, data. Nancy, anything to add before we move on? No, no, no. Let's move forward. We're All right, let's move today. forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Now you're probably thinking, okay, so it sounds like a good idea. The requirements are not that far-fetched. We want to try it out. How do we do this in the classroom? So how do we get the high flex model working in the classroom? Well, Nancy, 
What can you say about that? Flexibility. You know, data, data, data. Now we have flexibility is the key. That is what you need to do. You have to understand that both studies are great. We need to be aware and we need to know how to work with them. So being flexible is the most important thing. Don't, I don't mean yoga flexible, but kind of, you know, you know, Cirque du Soleil type of flexible. So that's yeah, it's possible. <laughs> no, we can, you can try. It will hurt, but. Not you know. right now, but okay. <laughs> okay, let's move forward. Yes. Uh, so flexibility is key. What else, Nancy? Well, being aware of some values. There's some principles that we have to make sure that we have. And in this case, for instance, the instructor should, should make sure that you plan a class and make sure that you have all the resources clearly defined and let the, the students know. Your resources have to be adaptable for online settings and also in classroom settings. And also it has to be based on the learning management system, okay? So that is going to be something that is going to help you. Additionally, you're going to be able, because you have different settings, you're going to want to record them like we're doing right now. So mm -hmm. you have the information and like David did at the beginning, we had the consent. We were told to do this and you guys have the consent to watch this video because we provided you with a legal document that says that you can do it. So you're going to be able to do this and requirements are going to be technology, being able to record things and having the resources for your class. Okay. So in a way, flexibility, but also reusability because Nancy, you're not really talking about something that teachers don't know how to do. You know, they already have experience in planning their face-to-face -face classes and how to create rapport with their students, how to do classroom management techniques, how to teach their academic subject, uh, whatever it is that they're teaching. And this past 12 months of working in a distance learning setting have actually forced the majority of us to develop online teaching skills and how to do the things we did in the classroom. Well, not exactly the same, but the, as much as we can you know, make them similar in an online setting. So this is also one of the reasons why we feel so strongly about the HyFlex model. Because if we were trying to implement the HyFlex model in the year 2019, for example, we would have faced a very different situation with teachers in the year 2019 and before the majority of the teachers had oodles of teaching experience in front of the student in classroom setting, but very few teachers really had experience in teaching in an online or just distance learning setting, not even online. Whereas today, you still have that in front of the student classroom experience and you have grown in your distance teaching experience. So you are ready teachers. You have the best of both worlds and you are ready to start working in a model like the high flex model. Mm -hmm. Ain't that right, Nancy? Yep. And you might say, well, you know, technology might be a problem, but yeah, I understand that. We, we do have issues with technology. However, if we are effective at, like for instance, you might have internet problems, but you make a recording and you can share that recording. That is going to be something that you're using technology and it's going to be accessible for the students. You might not even need to have internet uh, connection, but all of your students, I'm pretty sure, if you check, they have three cell phones, two, uh, and my sister has four. I don't know why, I only have one and it drives me crazy. But our kids have a lot, you know, to watch movies, the, to, you know, videos, songs, whatever you want to. They have a phone, they might have a tablet, they have a computer. And believe me, for that, they do have internet. Uh, they do. All right. Now, when you are working with the high flex model, flexibility is key in the in-person setting, but flexibility is also key on the online setting. Now, yeah. When we work online, we mentioned this uh, earlier in this presentation, the HyFlex delivery model requires online synchronous and asynchronous instruction. So let us delve a little bit deeper into both kinds of online instruction. And we would like to begin with asynchronous, which in a way is a little bit easier to manage because you have to make sure the materials are ready and you record your session 
uh, in any form or media. And then your students have the responsibility to come to the information and interact with the information. Now, when you're working asynchronously, Nancy mentioned it briefly a little bit, you know, a couple of minutes ago, it's important for you to be familiarized with your LMS or your learning management system, whatever that may be. Um, if you, for some reason, don't have an idea what a learning management system is, that is a pretty good place to start at, figure out what an LMS is. And while we do understand that not everybody has the same access to technology, that doesn't necessarily has to be a downer for your asynchronous or synchronous classes. Um, Nancy was mentioning a little bit briefly, uh, you need to be aware of your and your students digital infrastructure. Do they have a computer at home? Do they have a tablet at home? Do they have a cell phone and that's how they connect to your classes? Is it a shared device? Do they have internet at home or do they have to go somewhere else to have internet access? And that also is part of the HyFlex model in which you're redistributing the workload because you need to be aware of your students' needs. Now, this breaks with tradition. You know, normally we as teachers, we were told there was this very fine but very clear line between the teacher and the student. And that line was not to be crossed because of many several different reasons. I am not advocating to, for you to completely cross that line with your students, but that line has to be a little bit flexible. You have to be able to bend it without breaking it because you need to get to know your students better just so you know what their current digital infrastructure is so you can prepare yourself better to respond to that. And, and I'm sorry. And no, this, go ahead, go ahead. And this is also the, the beauty of it because here, for instance, if the student doesn't have at home the infrastructure, the technology, they can come to the classroom. They can, you know, they can come to the school. So you are giving them two options without penalizing either type of students. And the ones that have the resources, they can stay at home, be safe, like I'm staying at home, not going anywhere. But David said, mm, no, I don't have my, my bandwidth. It's not great. My phone, I want to use my data. My parents don't want to pay for additional data. So I'm going to go to the school. So that is one of the um, key elements. And right now, with the way that we're working, a lot of schools are slowly but surely trying to go back to the classroom setting. But most of the, 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 um, like the way that they're doing, like the technique or the strategy, is to do a hybrid. So this is something that is going to be something that can be adapted and that can do what they were saying that help in a smooth transition for those kids who still want to stay at home and the ones that actually we want to be at school because they really, really miss their classmates. Now, I also want to go back to something you just mentioned because you were saying this is not penalizing the student one way or another. You are not getting rid of your student when they are on a synchronous or asynchronous online moment of instruction, you're still going to be aware, you're still going to be taking care of them, you're still going to be taking care of their notes and their grades, and you're going to be doing follow up. This is not a model in which you will hurt and or penalize your students in any way. Quite the contrary, the high flex model has been shown to increase motivation in the students. Because yeah, Imagine that a student is now choosing to be with you at school when they have the option to stay at home. That is, that is powerful, teachers. Uh, and, and this is also a reflection of how our culture works. You know, earlier we were mentioning, you know, the type of parents that would say, my son is probably failing because you don't like him. But we also had that kind of parents who would approach administrators or teachers and say, Miss, Mister, I've heard so great, many great things about you. I want my son to be in your class next year. This is an extension of that kind of feeling, but now it's not coming out of the parent, it's coming out of the student. Exactly. And now and forever, if you are able to create a rapport with your student, a relationship with your student, they will do better in the classes because they're going the extra mile for that teacher that they like. And this is completely 
experiential. I've been there. Nancy has been there. You probably have been there. We all have favorites. We cannot deny it because we have those outward lining students that do more for you. They mm -hmm. find you after school. They want to have the conversation with you. And these are the new generations that are now desperately, well, maybe not desperately, but um, well, they're just looking for you seeking. on social media. Mm -hmm. They're seeking for you on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, wherever, not because they want to be your stalker or well, not all of them. Mm, you never know. Really I had two stalkers in my life, so. <laughs> okay. But because they really want to have that connection with their teacher. Yeah. I, I, let's go back a little bit, just a little bit to in the countries of Latin America, when we were still living in small towns, there were some key figures that every town had to have in order to consider themselves civilized. And these were usually a doctor, a priest, and a teacher. So when your students are trying to make those connections with you, it's because of that valued and seen position they have in their minds that this is my teacher. I have things I can learn. And as we all know, we, we, we really don't stop being teachers. We're teachers, you know, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It, it's always there. We can't turn it off. So when you work with the high flex model, whether they are in person or online, you're still working those connections. When you work asynchronously, you have to balance that workload and keep in mind that your students are going to be taking time online, not with you on the camera. And you have to prepare your materials and think about how you're going to engage them and how you're going to assess them without you being there. And on the other side of that coin, we also have the online synchronous instruction in which the mediation happens through technology, just as we're doing it right now. And while we still need to worry about content engagement and assessment, we do it a little bit different. Wouldn't you say, Nancy? Yeah, we're actually streaming the content, the information. So for instance, you're doing a presentation, you can go ahead and do, you know, like those Facebook videos that you do or your Instagram videos, you're live streaming your life. So you're presenting the information and it's actually happening at that moment, at that particular time. And that is what you're going to be doing with your students. You're going to use the cameras, like I told you before. One is going to be recording. The other one's going to have the mic, the projector, the everything, you know, the whole shebang, you're going to have it there. And you're going to be able to connect and create that learning management system with your students. And this one is, and also, this is the aspect of providing those resources for the students, because in order to, to create that management system, is your responsibility to give the proper resources for the students to actually be able to do what you're expecting them to do to reach the objective, which that should be the main word, objectives, okay? And how do we do this? How do we reach the objective? You know how teaching 101, you kind of know how to engage your students. You're like there, you're like dancing, and especially language arts teachers, we kind of crazy. Um, you find other ways like discussions, um, you know, you can do presentations, those, those things don't change. You can still do it. That's not a problem. You can do it in both settings, not, not to worry. And of course, you have to assess. So notice that this is a traditional classroom setting. You might not have a camera in front of you, but you're still performing. You're still performing on the, maybe in the corner or in front, or I don't know where you like to teach. You're still in front of an invisible camera. Okay, you're still engaging with your students. You're still di being dynamic. As you can see, David and I are kind of like, we need, we move our hands a lot. And we're, if we were to be in front of you, that would be kind of funny because uh, we're kind of funny together. So, and we were- Kind of, sort of, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So we are engaging our students and we're making sure that we're giving you a great performance because exactly. we want you to be participating. Okay. And we're keeping your attention as much as we can. But at I the same know. time, we're also going through our presentation time. Now, we're coming towards the end of our presentation time. So yes. we're going to pick it up just a little bit I know. Uh, to remind you that as we go from in-classroom to online synchronous and online asynchronous, please, oh, please don't forget about balancing that workload. The workload. You know, we really must plan 
to include active and engaging learning communities for either of our formats, in person or online, we need to manage both classroom settings. You know, you, you're still the teacher, teacher. You need to manage your students when they're in front of you. You need to manage your students when they are not in front of you, when you're teaching online and synchronously like we're doing right now, or if we were asynchronously, the classroom management does not stop when you turn off the computer or you close the door. And we also need to be a little bit flexible and it connects with what I was saying earlier about us being teachers 365, 24 seven, your office hours as a teacher may be affected. And while you start implementing the high flex model, you will see an increase in your workload. But as you move forward, as your students get used to, oh, sometimes in online, sometimes online with a teacher and sometimes in the school, then you will find that wonderful balance we're talking about. And your student interaction, your, sorry, your teacher-student interaction may be a little bit more difficult at the beginning, but it will improve as both you and your students get used to this new reality. Speaking about student instructor interaction, Nancy, what can you say about this part? In this case, students, regardless of the setting, you're going to interact. And like David said, you might your workload, personal workload, you might feel like you're, you're putting in a lot of you know, man hours. So yes, but you're creating a connection that maybe you didn't have before. The students are actually able to speak to you and they're sharing. And like David mentioned, the, the most valuable thing is, I think for a teacher is that the student chooses you and they believe in you. So at the end of the day, that's like the biggest, I don't know, most gratifying thing that we have. So yes, your interaction will change. You have to be there for your students. And of course, I'm not going to be working the whole time. I have a life as a, as a person, but you can go ahead and schedule hours to meet with your students or create minutes or maybe in the same class, start pulling students together. If you're doing Teams, you're doing Zoom. You can actually do individual meetings with the students and actually say, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? Are you understanding the topic? So you can create that interaction, not necessarily going off your office hours, but doing it immediately, okay? Maybe the outside office hours will be for the kids that are just watching the video, okay? Okay. Uh, I would say that if the relationship with your students is going to change in order to become much more effective for this new reality, you still need to be aware about their social emotional learning. Yeah. So don't forget about that. And teachers, we also invite you. There is absolutely positively nothing wrong with saying to yourself or to your administrators, uh, I really don't know how to manage social emotional learning in the classroom. Exactly. This is where professional professional development sessions like this ones we're having are so important and vital to us. We do not expect you to transition into these new models or into this new reality all by yourselves. So teachers now more than ever, you need to be aware that you're part of a collective and we're all trying to become better teachers to prepare our students for the future. Reach out, find your networking opportunities, you know, no one, absolutely no one is stopping you from trying to connect through social media with the two of us. You just have to look us up, look us up on LinkedIn. You know, we can exchange ideas with you. Mm -hmm. We are very grateful to Mextiso for the opportunity to share this way, but it doesn't have to stop there. So teachers, as we learn new things together, don't forget that as your relationship changes with your students, your relationship with your peers and your administrators also has to work. Mm -hmm. Now, to give you an example of how student instruction interaction can change with the HyFlex model, we're going to go to the source. We're going to go back to Beanie, which in his work teaching a HyFlex, sorry, a hybrid flexible course, provides some example of how to integrate this system. And I'm going to let the lovely Nancy tell you about it. Thank you so much. You so notice the three things that we've been talking about, content, engagement, and assessment. So those are like the, the three pillars of what we're working with at HyFlex. 
And then in the classroom, we're going to work with it in a specific way. So, you know, we make it dynamic, we make it interesting. Remember my expression of being a performer. And then the engagement, you create those meaningful experiences in the classroom, you connect, you create those spaces for the students, you do group activities, you find alternative assessments as well, and you're able to manage those assessments and see the progress yourselves in the class, okay? Now, in a, a synchronous setting, you're going to, of course, address the online population with, and also in a class. Like you're going to be filmed whenever you're teaching a class and you're going to have the other students in their computer watching you. So that's going to be a film. And then the, um, the other aspect is that because you have a film a recording, that recording is going to be used for the other um, option, which is asynchronous. So you're going to be splitting yourself. So notice that you don't have to do 4,000 plannings because what you're doing is that I am teaching my class. I am teaching to an audience that is behind a computer and then I'm going to be recorded for an audience that is not necessarily with me at that moment, okay? And then I am going to create my activities, my engagement process. My engagement activities don't need to vary that much. What is going to happen is that I am going to modify them just a little bit, but they're going to be the same because maybe your students cannot the same, do the same thing behind the screen or outside the, the classroom. So notice that it's filtering information and guiding you through the process that you won't see yourself affected. Of course, motivation teachers, that's the key. You need to find the motivation. And of course, sometimes we're going to be drained. Because believe me, whenever we do trainings, it's a lot of concentration and whatever you guys are teaching. You haven't you noticed, I don't know if there's like baby teachers here, kindergarten teachers, but I remember when I was teaching kindergarten, like no, I, only, I only survived one year. Seriously, after midday, I would go to sleep. Like it, it was it, like I had no energy whatsoever because you like put everything in it. You have when to I did kindergarten classes and we put the students to nap, I, I would nap with them. <laughs> I, we, we didn't we have a nap time. Yeah, did. no, but, and the thing is that you, you get so exhausted and, you know, you want to go do some exercises, but you're like, oh my God, you know, uh -uh, I'm going to move. And then the assessment, that is the beauty of it. The same assessment that you're doing in the class, you can do it online. It doesn't change. However, right. you know. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. So um, you're going to get the feedback, you're going to provide the information, and maybe the feedback, the moment of the feedback is going to vary. Yes, because whenever you have the a synchronized setting, you will have to provide the feedback in another time. But whenever you're doing it online and uh, whenever you're doing it in the classroom, the assessments don't need to change. Yes. And, and I'm pretty sure some of you are already making the connections. And you're already saying, oh, you know what? As I'm planning for the in-classroom setting, I can very easily modify this activity to be asynchronous or asynchronous. And I can change this here and I can change that because that's how teachers' minds work. We are given a challenge and we go straight to it. So as you're doing those connections, let's go into the final part of this delivery model, which is assessing learning progression. And you know, Nancy was already mentioning you know, the importance of assessing um, in the year 2007, researcher Macmillan used to, used to say that the goal of formative assessment evaluation is the improvement of student motivation and learning. And as we have mentioned in several points of this presentation, the HyFlex model empowers students by allowing them to choose when to show up for a class in person, when to show up for a class on a synchronous online setting, or when to just you know, work at their own pace Mm -hmm. in their own place in an asynchronous online setting. Out of all of these areas of interaction, assessment never really goes away. But as Nancy mentioned uh, very briefly, it doesn't have to be a different kind of assessment for each learning setting. You can use the same one, teachers out there, just you know, with the proper modifications, maybe to incorporate technology, maybe to incorporate your LMS, maybe to not incorporate any of that and you just make the assessment online on a synchronous setting, but you can use the same assessment. Formative assessments or formative evaluations are still important for the HyFlex model, as is 
being able to give your students a grade that will go into a report card, which then will allow them to move on and advance into the next grade. So regardless of the setting which you teach, you're still going to be doing assessment. Ain't that right, Nancy? Yep. Assessing is important. Can deny that. And it's also because it's going to give you a profile of what the student knows. And you can go ahead and modify. You can add additional resources um, and provide them with something that can help them out. So I know that right now we're going over, we're just planting a seed. We're yes. literally planting a seed for you guys to be curious about it, to experiment the options. And maybe your school cannot implement 100% the HyFlex system. That is okay. That is not a problem. You can implement some of these strategies of the HyFlex system. Of course, due to the time that we have, we cannot really go in depth with every aspect of it. But we do want to make sure that you're curious about it and also understand that you can modify and you can adapt the system according to your needs. That is why it's flexible. That is why it can be doable. But again, you don't need to do it all. You can take, exactly. you know, slowly but surely. You can take baby steps with this and mm -hmm. always bear in mind that in its name, the hybrid flexible model, the idea behind it is to give students, teachers, administrators, and parents a way forward. It's not just about changing the way you teach and the way students learn. This is a way to move forward. We cannot stay the same again. A quote that I have heard very often associated with Einstein, I'm, I don't know for sure if he said it or not, but the quote says that expecting to see changes out of doing the same thing over and over and over again is madness. Mm -hmm. We have been working with an educational system and an educational paradigm that had its foundations in the industrial revolution, the first one. Yep. And if I remember correctly, please, Nancy, correct me if I'm wrong, we're already transitioning into the fourth industrial revolution. Exactly. And we're still using the First, educational paradigm, we have to evolve, we have to change, we have to adapt. And the high flex model is a way forward. And like Nancy was just saying, today we wanted to share this information with you. You probably found some points in common that you felt like you already knew them, but the idea, the concept of the high flex model, maybe that was not familiar to you. Now it is. And we would like to invite you, I would dare say, we would like to challenge you mm -hmm. to learn more about this model, to find someone that would like to have an open and frank discussion about it in your school system, in your teaching network, because we need to find two way, ways to move forward. This is one, it's not the only one, but it is the one that we wanted to bring to your attention because we strongly believe it has the best possibility of actually happening right now and delivering benefits and results right now. Yeah. Now, uh, Nancy, anything else that you would like to add? No, just that is something that, like, like we, we, we mentioned before, and I think we made it clear, technology is here to stay. Education will change. We will always have a job, but we need to change our mindset. We need to be open-minded to the functions of technology. We have to be open-minded to the fact that our students are not going to learn the way that we learn. We learn in an old-fashioned format of drill, 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 drill. And now this type of generation is like, let me see it, let me taste it, let me touch it. So let me experience it. Exactly. It's all about the experience. It's all about making meaningful experiences while teaching them and within their learning process. So this is one of the beauties of the system. You can be flexible. You can understand their needs and even allow your students to help you and to teach about technology. You have no idea how that creates a bond. Whenever the student feels that they have been so important that they taught something to you, oh my God, that is so wonderful. It's like, you have no idea. I had a student that wrote me an essay and I think I'm going over court about uh, those overboard, uh, no, how do you call that? Those those things that used to fly, you know, like that movie, overboards? I Hoverboards. That one. 
So I had no idea. And the kid was in, in high in middle school. He wrote this paper about engineering and about the differences between the, like the, you know, the skaters thing. And I'm like, I was like, oh my God. I'm like, really? That happens? Like, yeah, I did the test by myself. I'm like, Jesus Christ, you have to show me. But it created a very positive bond between this student who has been, who had been very problematic. Mm -hmm. And he felt so happy that someone listened to him. And someone actually found his research interesting. So create those spaces, nice. allow that to happen. And believe me, technology is not your enemy. Technology is your friend. Data is not your enemy. Data is your friend. And being able to adapt, we do that. We do differentiation in the classroom. It's kind of like this. So we're differentiating the settings. Excellent. Well, what a better way to come to the end of our presentation by, by sharing a, a, a very real, very honest experience from the classroom, from our teaching experience. So Nancy, I wanna thank you for your time and thank for you, your David. part in this session. Uh, we are happy that you joined us today. We're gonna have a Q&A moment at this point. So we will see you at the Q&A. Uh, make sure you have some questions for us because well, we've been talking for a while, but we would like to continue to talk with you about this high flex model, any gouts, any questions you may have, anything that piqued your interest, or if you just want to have a conversation with us, that flies as well. So we'll see you in a moment for the Q&A. Thank you for the opportunity for this presentation. And let's start with the questions.